all of that grading before the holiday and looking forward for to some peace and, and rest over the, the break. I'm Tracy Misho. I am Associate Professor of Tourism and Hospitality at the University of Southern Maine in Portland, Maine. And I am your NINA president. We will get started with a number of reports uh, after we do introductions. And then we have a fun presentation uh, from our vice president and our one of our great students that we have here at the University of Southern Maine and uh, to hopefully get you excited and pique your interest for the spring conference that will be in Portland, Maine, hosted by the University of Southern Maine. So with that, then I'd like to start with everybody just going around and introducing yourself quickly, just your name and um, position and, and where you work. So we can all make sure we're familiar with each other. Let's see, I will, maybe I'll just call out names to keep it flowing quickly, Frank. Hi, I'm Frank Tsai from Sri Pirak University. And this is my fifth year at Sri Pirak. And also uh, before I was administrator and get back to as a faculty position and join Nina, I think this is my fourth year. And currently I'm in Oklahoma, it's warm and not tell me, don't say anything, just stay in my corner. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed the meeting today. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Christine? I am Christine Kleber. I'm with the School of Sport, Tourism, and Hospitality Management at Temple University. I'm an associate professor and also program director of our event and entertainment management curriculum. Great. Good to see you. Fred? Uh, Fred Mayer, retired, retired, and retired. Off uh, <laughs> tomorrow to teach in Hong Kong for a week. So... Donna told me I couldn't slow down, so I keep going. Sounds really retired. Sounds right? good. <clears throat> Great. Donna? <laughs> good morning. Donna Albano, Stockton University, Hospitality Tourism Event Management here in New Jersey. Good to see you. David? Um, good morning, everyone. David Swiger, Director of Culinary Arts, Hospitality, and Sport Management at Northampton Community College um, in Northeast Pennsylvania, and I am a past president of the NIDA Feder uh, Federation. Great. Welcome to the meeting. Elizabeth. Good morning, all. Sorry I'm off camera. I'm, trans I'm driving. Um, I am uh, with Frederick Community College in Frederick, Maryland, um, as the director of the Hospitality, Culinary, and Tourism Institute. Great. Good to see you again. Michael. Uh, my name is Michael Tews. I'm an associate professor at Penn State University. And my research assistant, my teaching assistant on my corner is Scout. Oh, love it. Oh. Okay. Love it. Paul. Hi, I'm Paul Bagden, Johnson & Wales University. And uh, I do guest service management and uh, a few other things. <laughs> Great. Good to see you. Caroline. Yes, good morning. I'm Caroline Paris. I'm an alumni of Tracy's program and also her first PhD student up at UMaine studying agritourism. Great. Thanks, nice. Caroline. Uh, Christine. Did okay, do oh sorry, already went. So my my names are switching places here. <laughs> uh Chuck. <laughs> Hi, uh, Chuck Miner, assistant professor in the Hospitality, Recreation, and Tourism Management uh, Department at East Stroudsburg University in Northeast PA. Great. And one of our, our NINA um, executive committee members, too. Uh, Elizabeth. Oh, sorry. Jeez. <laughs> Forrest. <laughs> Good morning. Forrest Ma, assistant professor at University of Southern May. Work with Tracy. Yay. <laughs> Iris. Uh, Iris, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, Iris Gersh, um, program director and um, associate professor at Fairleigh Dickinson. Um, and yeah, I mean, I haven't really been too involved with Nina. So, you know, I'm hoping to get more involved. 
Thank you. Great. Well, I'm so glad you're here. Uh, Jennifer Forney. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Jennifer Forney. I am at uh, SUNY Jamestown Community College um, in business and tourism and hospitality. I am the director of conference and events for NINA. Um, so good to see you all. Great. Hi, Jen. Uh, Jennifer Ahrens. Hi, good morning, everybody. Jennifer Ahrens, faculty member at Stockton University in the Hospitality, Tourism, and Event Management Program, I'm also involved in our new esports management program. I'm looking forward to our trip to Maine in the spring. Great. We're looking forward to having you. <laughs> Joe. Hi, Joe Scarcelli, Associate Professor, York College of Pennsylvania. I apologize, no video. My, my connection is terribly spotty. And I am still uh, the treasurer. <laughs> and we hope always will be, Joe. Long running. It's good. It looks like it'll be that way, Fred. <laughs> no, well, you're really good at it. After Paul, you had big shoes to fill, and you've done a great job, Joe. Yep. Great. Uh, Rick. Sure. Rick Legeski, RIT Saunders College of Business, and uh, currently taking on the role of their Associate Director of their Leadership Academy. Good to see you all. Good to see you, Rick. And Ya Ling. Hi, everyone. Good morning. My name is Ya Ling Chen. Uh, I am from SUNY Brockport, and I'm currently a uh, Director of Education. Nice to see you all. Great. Great to have everybody here this morning. Did I miss anyone? Well, oh, I don't Jeff, know that, Jeff, as you say, Jeff, oh, and we Jeff don't and, need and just, you know, past president, vice president. Yeah. Sorry about that, guys. Jeff. No, it's, all, it's all good. Good morning, everyone. Great to see you all. I'm Jeff Lally. And I'm a professor and coordinator of sport event and marketing management and the School of Business at Wyatt University. Great, great. And Noel. <laughs> and hi, everyone. Noel Kershaw Nailers at Stockton University with my colleagues, Donna and Jennifer. I'm the chair of the hospitality program as well as the chair of esports. And Paul, I was just in your neck of the woods, so I'm sorry that we didn't get to connect. I just met with Brian and Michael. So glad to be here uh, for the meeting and excited to see you all soon in Maine. Oh, sounds great. Well, good. Well, welcome everyone again. Um, we'll just start going down through the, the reporting and then uh, we can see if there's questions for anyone and then we'll jump into our fun presentation at the end. Uh, so the president's report, um, well, first off, uh, is Maureen, uh, do we have minutes here? I don't know if that went out. Um, so we'll just skip over that section. Um, but uh, for the president's report, we've the executive committee's been busily working this fall to get the conference up and ready. Uh, you will uh, be able to register for that, uh, for uh, the conference. If you're able to submit your research, please do that as soon as possible. Uh, the deadline's in January, but the, the sooner you can get it in, the, the better for everybody. Um, the And as soon as the registration links come out uh, for the conference, try to get your... Uh, housing, uh, your accommodations uh, registered. Okay, great, great. Thank you, Donna. Um, so yeah, we'll come back to that within, within minutes. Um, try to get registered at the accommodation as soon as possible uh, so that we can, there's, we have a, only a certain room block. So if you wanna get that deal, get it, get it registered early. We'll talk more about that later, but the board's been putting in a lot of time to get that up and going in a timely manner for you all. Very excited for the conference. Uh, been doing the, the Rise and Grind series, which a number of you participated in, which has been great. And then we've been participating at the ICRE level in different types of meetings. Um, the most recent at the, the president's level, really looking at ways that um, we can uh, fundraise outside of just membership and sponsorship at the conferences that, um, you know, where budgets are always tight. And so um, one of the things I've been involved with and actually bringing in Caroline is having some conversations around grant funding as a nonprofit organization. That's not something we've tapped into very much uh, in the past. And that's 
some of our expertise. And so um, working with Fran and, and the staff there to look at some of the options of, of perhaps tapping into you know, private foundations all the way to federal funding for, for projects. It's surprising um, the the connection into to federal funding that you might not think about in economic development and, and um, uh, housing and urban development and whatnot have programming a lot of times that do fit with, with what our focus is in tourism and hospitality. And so at the president's level, those are some of the things we've been working on. Fred made a great presentation last time about um, uh, trying to set up um, some legacy donations for when people pass on to, to be able to um, donate parts of their estate, perhaps to, to ICRI as well. So and I'm glad um, to talk to anyone about that issue at any time. <laughs> We're doing yeah. it for the future fund. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So those are some of the things that the, the president's level we've been working on. And then I will turn it over to our vice president, Noel. Thank you, Tracy. And um, as I reflect on some of the things I've been working on, I really have to do a shout out to Jennifer Forney, because without her and her leadership in so many projects, um, that she is guiding, such as the RFP process, um, along with Donna Albino um, and Jeff Lolly and a few others that have contributed feedback. So thank you for that, because we will be looking for our 2026. And no pressure, Paul, but I did mention um, a possible location in my meeting while I was up in Providence. Um, you know, so as we're working through those details, if anyone on here and their institution is interested, it's really about establishing a process. Um, with clear guidelines and frameworks to help us produce a robust conference that really adds value for our members. So again, Jennifer, you know, thank you so much for helping us to lead this initiative and for everyone that contributed um, to make sure that, you know, we can really continue on the way we have. Um, additionally, I do want to point out, and I won't steal too much thunder, but please note we have confirmed the dates for Stockton's 2025 conference um, as well. So um, in true fashion, um, you know, our ideas are already coming and how we can complement the amazing things the team has prepared uh, for Portland, Maine. Um, so that's coming at an ICRE level. I will tell you, it's been a little bit challenging um, at the VP level right now just because of teaching schedules, but there's lots of initiatives, um, many that, you know, Tracy has alluded to, many that are coming down. Um, but above all, really trying to garner support for the upcoming 2024 ICRE Summer Conference. Um, that submission portal is also open. So if you have not had an opportunity to look at that, consider your submissions. Um, I'm not sure on my screen if I can see it, if Maureen's on here, but you know, start to think about the innovative things that we're doing and the synergies that we can leverage. So, you know, even for our Nina conference in Maine, Maureen and I are planning to bring you cannabis and esports. So these are just some ideas um, as you're looking at your research streams and opportunities mm. and how we can come together to help with some of the challenges we're all experiencing right now from retention, enrollment, and things of that nature. Um, and then, of course, today I'm here with, uh, we're going to be leading you through um, with Cara Caroline. She has been, you know, an amazing resource um, and creative mind that's going to bring, you know, some of the highlights of what we're going to likely see while we're in Maine and some of the really cool stuff that Tracy and many of her other students have engaged in to truly make a difference and bring voices um, from Indigenous partners heard and, and really saved. So that's my update. Thank you. Thanks, Noel. Um so with the secretary's report, we'll take this moment now. The minutes did go out um, in the in the agenda and the invite. So hopefully people have had a chance to review that. And um, we'll just ask for if there's any edits or um, mistakes, anything that needs to get adjusted in there, any issues. Then if not, then we'll be able to accept the minutes. We don't have to do an official vote on the minutes, but we do just like to put them out there and make sure that they're accurate and everybody agrees with them. And so in that case, we'll accept the minutes for the record. And we'll uh, move down to, to Joe uh, for the treasurer's report. So uh, not a bunch to report. Uh, position of the Federation is, is strong as it has been for several years. Um, the Promise Award scholarship applications close tomorrow. Um, we've had quite a few of those coming in, um, and we are starting to receive sponsorships for the um, 
the spring conference. So that is encouraging as well. Great. That's Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Um, and before I turn it over to Jennifer, who I will put my accolades in there too for all the great work that that she's done and is doing. Maureen, even though she's not here, um, has done an amazing job on the communications aspect, not just taking notes as a secretary, but getting all the communications organized and and into a time frame and whatnot. So really appreciate all of her work as well. So Jen, take it away. Okay, I stopped driving so I could uh present properly, sorry. <laughs> um, no, well, thank you for everyone's kind words. I sometimes feel like I'm just kind of floating along, so I appreciate that. Um, so uh, updates on the conference, so we're excited to be in Maine. Um, our hotel block is set. The registration link is actually ready and active. It is active and ready to go out. So we'll get that out to you guys ASAP. So you can start registering, getting your, the hotel information there with the block code. Um, we have some additional extra activities um, like the, the welcome reception, obviously. And then we have um, a foodie tour, which is optional and additional fee, but that you can do all of that right through Eventbrite. Um, and then um, we, uh, uh, what was it say? the RFP process, um, uh, I've completed the updated um, form. And so um, we're just getting, I'm sent, the board needs to approve it. Um, and the idea is to get that out to you all the first of the year um, so we can start um, deciding, uh, you guys can start submitting if you want to host a conference. Um, so we have um, Maine um, this spring, we have Stockton um, next year. And so we're looking for, we. I would love to have like two years um, going so um we'd love to have uh submissions for 26 and 27 i know that's hard to think about in 2027 but it comes really fast i can't believe that it's you know we're already kind of planning for 2025 so um we would love to have you host uh i you know this is my second um year of my term um However, I would love to run again. So, um, you know, who knows? <laughs> who knows if, uh, you know, you decide to host, we could work together again. Um, and, and, you know, like Noelle said, you know, the idea is to, I mean, the goal is to bring value and have a robust conference. So our members really have the ability to come and network, but also have that tangible takeaway um, that, you know, that we can go and apply um, and improve our classrooms or improve our, improve our research or um, any anything like that. So um, we always value the support of our members uh, in the planning process as well as the conference. Um, I know uh, most of our board members by default are members of the conference planning committee, but Christine um, from Temple and Ruth, and we have Sean from Ocean Community College just joined our planning um, committee. So if you want to get involved, it's not too late. Um, and if you want to get involved for next year, um, please uh, reach out. So that's really all that I have as updates, but look for that registration link to come out. Um, and um, I look forward to um, seeing everybody in Maine. Great, thanks, Jennifer. And I'll put a plug in. We are currently asking for sponsors and um, thank you to those that have committed already. And if you haven't and your, your university or organization or you know businesses that might be able to, please um, let us know that really helps to offset costs um, for the conference and keep it at a, a registration level, which is still under $100. Um, and that definitely doesn't cover our costs. So any of these sponsorship funds um, that come in are, are, are really helpful toward um, keeping it affordable for everyone. So put that plug in uh, and we'll turn it over to Ya Ling, their director of education. Hello everyone. 
Um, so I just wanted to start with uh, thank you everybody for your participation of Rice and Grind. And uh, so I can see the data. We do have a pretty good increase for participation for this year. And in all our sessions, are, uh, we had a great uh, conversation. So thank you so much for your support, for Rise and Grind. And uh, I'm just happy that uh, Nina played an important role for continuous education and professional development for our member members. And uh, again, thanks so much for uh, you guys' participation. And uh, we'll continue to doing this in the spring. And we have uh, we will ha we'll be having three Rise and Grind. Uh, all the guest speakers are lined up, so please looking forward, and i also looking forward to seeing all of you uh, coming back to Rise and Grind. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you, Yarling. The, I think the topics and, and the presentations have just been excellent this year, so I uh, really appreciate your good work on that side of things. Thanks. <laughs> okay. And okay, Director of Marketing and Member Services, Frank. Frank, you're allowed to come out of your corner now. We're giving you the <laughs> official permission. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, we are currently full swing um, working on our spring conference and I am helping to get those uh, funding in. However, uh, we are still working on it and towards the end of the semester, end of the year, uh, the email went out, but not getting quite a uh, good amount of responses back. Hopefully, if you hear something or you know somebody, it's good chance of uh, getting themselves involved and sponsor our conferences. Please reach out and we'll get that night up. At the same time, um, I'm working with the iCree label to get our marketing piece working in the way uh, Cree hope that works. And I am hoping every one of you here and also your colleague in your university or institutions if you receive any pieces through social media or email, please share and that will expand the network and also spread the good words out. At the same time, we will encourage you to uh, sign up for our conference coming up and also the, uh, I'm not speaking for the research, but uh, it is available right now for you to submit your uh, manuscript so we can get everybody there in time and uh, all of the pieces should be in place now. So those available links through social media, through, through email, please like and share. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. So yeah, if you get a, a letter from Frank asking for money, um, and even if your university might not be able to, to do it at the level, maybe in, in past years, we know a lot of our universities are um, you know, struggling with budget right now, even at the $200 level helps. So um, thanks, Frank, for that. And and again, just to encourage you, you got good news. You have an amazing thing that's just happened in your program or a project of students. Let us know and let's put it out there. It's inspiring. I love reading about people's good success, um, you know, so uh, please feel free to share that with Frank as well. And, and so we can all celebrate with you. Um, great. So, Marcus, uh, Director of Research. Is he here? I don't think he's on, Tracy. Oh, okay. So, as, a few weeks ago, the link went out uh, to submit research. And so, I really appreciate Marcus and working with Noel, who is our former Director of Research, uh, to get that link out uh, in a really timely manner so that everybody can hopefully submit either research paper, poster, or an idea for a session. Um, as Noel had said, attract, engage, retain. This is a concept that is timely for us. How do we do that with our own students and our own programs, but also for the industry um, as things have you know, change quite a bit in, in the workforce out there and, and what people's wants and needs are. And so, any type of um, research or or sessions that ideas that you have around that we're really interested in in that piece of it. Of course, also research is open broadly as well. And the date for that, I believe, is January fifteenth. Is that right, Noel? 
Yes, and, and if I can add as well, Tracy, you know, many of you might be aware that Eta Sigma Delta is doing their first time this, this coming new year, an undergraduate research symposium. Um, and I want to thank all of those that are the Eta Sigma Delta reps on here and our very own Donna Albano. Um, you know, one of the things that we're hoping that you will share, and I put it in the chat, if you're looking for a holiday give back, um, you know, consider sponsoring a student. This is really a great opportunity to engage, and this is our future. Um, you know, so please don't, um, I want to say exclude and try to include, especially if you have any really great um, student projects. I know we're going to talk a little bit. I know Tracy, um, as our president, engages in a ton of research with her students. I'm currently working on a few projects. Um, our students are going to have an opportunity to do that as well. So, um, you know, encourage your students um, and showcase all of the things that we do that really contribute and impact um, our profession. And I see a hand up, Donna. Is it okay to jump in a little off topic? I mean, kind of on topic. Is it okay? Sure. I just, I Michael too is on the call and I hope he doesn't mind. I have highly encouraged him yeah. to yeah. submit for the Nina um, spring conference because his research is so interesting. And, and Michael, do you mind me putting you on the spot and telling our colleagues what your work is? No, please go ahead and then I can jump in if no, necessary. No, I don't even want to try to explain it. I just know I'm really <laughs> excited to see it, but I would love for you to explain it. That, yes. that will tell so, us what it is. <laughs> so I've been doing uh, some work with Lego Serious Play, Lego in the classroom. So I think, A, we could do, like my graduate students and I, we could do a research presentation as well as do a workshop. So, you know, I had a call earlier in the week with Donna, and I was saying of all the little management tricks that I've done in the classroom, I find that Lego Serious Play is very engaging. And I know they've done some sessions at the Larger Creek Conference and in Europe. Uh, I've learned this skill and I think it's really valuable. And also I've done some variations on it. So I think it'd be a fun, engaging session, both academically, you know, just to show how it works from a research point. But I think it'd be a fun thing to do at the conference. So Michael, yeah. if you don't mind, I'm a, I'm a Lean Six Sigma black belt and we do a lot with Lego um, and, and makers and, and, you know, using that to teach a variety of different topics. I would love to see you submit that um, and I'll speak on behalf of Marcus. So if you need any, you know, guidance or help on what that might look like in that, you know, that format, I'd be more than happy to help in any way I can. So I'll put my email in the chat. Um, I'm a colleague with Donna, so we can chat more about, you know, how that can shape at the conference. Okay, great. Thank you, Donna, for, you know, giving me that shout out. No, Jing, I'm good at that. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, that that's great. And these kind of innovative, engaging, right? It's called attract, engage, retain. You know, that applies to us too at the conference. The more we can have these really engaging sessions, I think the more uh, fun, <laughs> which is okay to have fun as mm -hmm. well as learn. You know, in fact, that helps learning. So, um, so yeah, this is really great. Great ideas. Um, all right. Uh, anything else on that piece? All right, so then we'll move on to our members at large. Uh, Chuck is here. Uh, Maria is not. Maria is our Canadian colleague. Really excited. She is planning to bring students down uh, to the conference from Canada and work with us since we are so close. Maine does stick up into Canada, so our, our Canadian neighbors feel like family and, and are a lot of times. So Glad to have that close partnership. She's been working on really trying to re-engage um, and newly engage the Canadian schools, which we've tended to have a very small amount as part of ICRE in the past. And so she's been reaching out as part of her work. And, and so we really appreciate that. And just one, I guess, one other um, shout out about the uh, conference in terms of bringing students. It's such a great conference for student research. I have brought students there uh, uh, last year, was it? Or the year before, um, uh, you know, students can can come in and it's, it's a super supportive environment for first time presentations. Um, students have one, you know, best research paper, best poster or whatnot. And, and it's so meaningful. It's a great kind of first step conference. So I, I would encourage if you've got students that you've been partnering with on research or doing class projects, it's a, it's gonna be a great environment. And we plan to have a number of our students there. I've already 
had two classes working on the conference. We have interns, student interns, um, plan to have student panels. And so there will be a student contingent there for, for other students coming in to mingle with. And if you do plan to bring them, get reach out to us because uh, we'd love to help them all make connections even before they actually arrive or or put them together, maybe even present on, on one of the student panels we're, we're trying to organize. So with that then, uh, Chuck, is do you have any updates uh, from your side of things on the members at large? No, I've just been really busy with uh, with ESU. Fall semester is always tough for me. So I have nothing. Okay, great. So then we will end our uh, updates with our past president, Jeff Lowley. Thank you, Tracy. So one of my responsibilities as past president is to run the nominations committee and election for the next cycle of NINA leadership. And so first I have to thank my amazing committee. I don't think Avina's on the call, but Donna and David are, who we've met several times already and helping me to cultivate this next group of potential leaders for Nina, which is really important because as we say, it takes a village and we need great people to work and continue to move us forward. So about two weeks ago, a call for nominations went out. I'm sure you all saw it. The deadline is January 12th of 2024. We have already received some interest from individuals and that's great. And we're continuing to cultivate that. We have four positions that we're looking to, that we need to elect for this year. Of course, the vice president is every year because it's a three-year vice president, president, past president position. But we're also looking you know, for the director of education position, the director of uh, conference and events, and the treasurer position. So those are the four positions that we are looking to um, seek nominations for. And then by mid-February, you should see the final slate once the board approves it. Go out and you'll see the person's name, headshot, and platform statement. And then I think we have elections slated to go from February 15th until March 15th. And so you'll get more information on that to be able to vote. The goal is that by the middle of March, we have our new elected members in those positions so that they can start acclimating themselves on the board and are ready up and ready at the speed to go by the time we start the next academic year. The other thing that you'll hear from me later, probably sometime in January, is last year the board approved two conference scholars, three, actually three for each of the conferences. So three scholarships for the NIDA conference and three scholarships. These are for the registration for the IPRE conference, the annual conference. And so probably in late January, you'll see uh, the call go out for that. And, you know, actually last year we did actually, I believe, Joe, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe we did award three NINA conference scholarships, but we didn't award three ICRE. And with everyone's budgets really as tight as they are, you know, it's, I would encourage everyone to take advantage of applying for that. You know, again, I know it's not as much for the NINA, but it's, uh, what, $600, I think, to register for the ICRE conference, 595 or something like that. So that will go out a little bit later in the spring. And again, it's gonna be a simple form, for the candidate to fill out, but I encourage everyone or faculty members that you have or colleagues, uh, grad students, what have you, to, to apply for these because we want to we want to award them. So that'll come out later in the spring. I think that's everything. Great. Thank you, Jeff. And I just have to thank Jeff as past president coming in this year. He had organized things so well, templates for for the meetings and and just had everything managed so well that my job has been very easy this fall. So thank you, Jeff, and still highly engaged, taking on on pieces. And even like I look at our chat and all of you guys jumping in, Donna, here's the minutes and whatnot. I think I just appreciate all of you. I've appreciated this board and, and all of you as members, um, supportive, helping out, working together. Um, and I'm so excited to, to see Hopefully most of you, or if not all of you at the, the spring conference in Maine. And so I'll, I'll just, you've heard us talk and I wanna give a couple of minutes in case there are any other questions that you have for us or um, updates or, or issues that you have that apply to any of the, the information that, that we just shared with you.
Okay. All right. Well, good. Hopefully that means we explain things well and you're pleased with, with what you're doing. Um, you know, we, we try to make sure that we're serving our members as best as possible, giving you value for your membership, making those connections. And so if at any point you have ideas, thoughts, issues, please reach out to, to any of us on, on the board and um, we can talk about it. So with that, then I will do a quick review of our conference dates and then um, see if there's any old business or new business. So as we've been talking about our 2024 spring conference, we'll be here in Portland, Maine at the University of Southern Maine as the host, um, April 5th to 7th. So coming in Thursday night, with a opening reception at our brand new McGoldrick Center. And then uh, the bulk of the conference on the Friday and Saturday morning, finishing up with some engagement sessions with our legacy series. And then um, if you wanna stay Saturday afternoon, we've got a great foodie tour that is being offered at a, at a big discount for, for people. Uh, we are known as a foodie city. Uh, sometimes people don't believe it. I had someone from, from New Orleans say, like, you're not the foodiest city in the U.S. I was like, ah, well, you can go check it out. Google it. Um, we are a place a lot of people like to live. And so over the years, we've attracted some very high caliber chefs in particular, which then have attracted others. And we have an amazing food scene. And so you'll get a chance to experience that in the foodie tour. Um, we will be having a lobster bake uh, for our lunch. So you will get the lobster. We'll do the full lobsters and teach you how to, how to crack them and, and do all that right. We'll put on the plastic bibs and all that fun stuff. And if you don't like lobster, I guess that's okay. We will have some other options, but um, you know, we'll do the whole, the full main experience. And then if you want to stay, um, you know, I encourage you Saturday night or come in early. There's lots of other fun, fun options too, um, to do. And we'll share those with you over the next couple of months. And then as Noel mentioned in, um, well, this summer, I should mention the iCree conference will be to our neighbors in the North up in Montreal, Quebec. So you'll get the North Eastern North American experience over this next year. That should be a, a very nice conference. Montreal is an in, beautiful, incredible city. And so um, hopefully we'll see everybody there. And then in 2025, next spring, March 28th to the 30th, Stockton University. So we'll be going um, down to the Jersey Shore, Atlantic City, a place I've been spending quite a bit of time now that my uh, competitive surfer daughter is, is on the, the U.S. circuit and they do a bunch of their competitions right there. So a place I've is almost becoming second home. I'm traveling there so much. And uh, I, I had the chance to uh, uh, come into one of Noel's classes uh, a month ago, I think at this point, to talk about sustainable surf tourism and see the beautiful campus that they have there. So it's going to be a great conference next year. Really excited for that. With that, uh, yes, David. Do we want to share the 2020, the location for the 2025 great conference, like great conference in the summer? Uh, sure. Do you want to <laughs> go? Sure. Because um, Tracy and myself were both on the iCRE board and we had a meeting two weeks ago, and it was announced that the 2025 conference is going to be in Indianapolis, Indiana, and but it will not be in July. It is going to be in June of 2025, because it's going to be held in conjunction with the High Tech Conference, and it will be in downtown Indianapolis at the JW Marriott, and that's what we know so far. There you go. Idea. Good dose of the Midwest there for you. Yeah. Hopefully a little cooler than la last year. <laughs> Great. Thank I, you, I, David. I wanna, Tracy, I want to put in a plug for Portland. I've been to three conferences in Portland over the last three years, and every time, excellent food, warm people, a great museum of art, fascinating stuff. So 
uh, just to go to Portland to be with Tracy is already a win. <laughs> but when they, they'll send out stuff about the uh, various restaurants and book some nice meals, because it's a really wonderful, welcoming city with everything you can imagine. It's, it's one of those up and coming cities in the area of Maine. And we can drive there. And I don't want to say this in any negative way, but there's lots of reasons to be in Portland. Uh, other than you all, there weren't much reasons to be in Morgantown, West Virginia. <laughs> well, we certainly, you know, we are, we're called Vacation Land for a reason. And, you know, I will say that it was really lovely out in, in West Virginia. I went to the University of Pittsburgh. So, you know, Morgantown was just over the border, beautiful little city and lots of great stuff. And, and I think we all had a great time at that conference. Um, but we're really looking forward to people coming to check out Vacation Land with us. Um, so thanks for the, the shout out on that, Fred. And I see Jennifer, you have your, your hand up there. Yes, I was trying to use my Zoom etiquette. And uh, so, um, well, two things. I was in Portland uh, this summer and it's beautiful and um, so beautiful that I don't mind going when it's colder. So, it because it was rainy when we were there. So it was, I'm excited, I'm excited to go see it again, to go again and visit. Um, uh, one question I wanted to ask. So for the comfort for for the Portland conference um I put on our stuff four to six fourth to the six do you want me to change that I mean I know you have the fifth to the seventh um like so like our registration link and everything says April 4th to the sixth mm -hmm. the so the fourth is thir Thursday, Thursday or Wednesday sorry what the fourth is Thursday yeah so four five six yeah that that's fine yep that okay. is that's actually accurate so it should be thursday to saturday yeah that's what i have on okay there, so. and if i said something different than that i apologize no it, it says be... the fifth through the seventh here so i just wanted to make oh, sure i had okay the... and that was probably me so okay okay i gotta keep I, you oh i see what you're show. saying Sorry. Yeah. I see what you're saying on the the agenda thing. Yeah. Yeah. It, yes. It should be. And I think that that was from before we like a long time ago, we had okay, been okay. like a, yeah, Friday to Sunday, but it, it it is four to six. Yeah. Thank you for pointing that out. Four to no, six. That, okay. <laughs> yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Didn't know, even that, sounds like cocktail hour. And then um, not to take up too much. So one more time, one more thing. Um, You mentioned the legacy lecture. So I'm going to be resending that Google form um, again. So just be thinking of, you know, a Nina member that really has, is a legend for us um, that we can recognize and, you know, hear um, from them as well. So we'll be sending out a nomination form um, probably again in January, just as it, so it's at the top of everyone's list. Um, and if you're, you know, new, to Nina, um, you know, we just recognize the greats of Nina who have really contributed to Cree um, and, you know, just learn about um, what they've experienced over the years. So. Great. Thanks, Jen. Does anyone have old business, anything? Um, that, Jennifer, yep. when you, uh, just an idea. Um, if you if when you send out the in, encouragement to nominate a legacy people, if you could send out the list, um, I know we did Nick and I know we did Carol Cooper. And you. And yeah, but it's <laughs> you can't get rid of me. I'm like a bad penny. Um <laughs> but the, I I mean it it may trigger us to do memories. Okay, so like a list of previous. Yeah, uh, list of, uh, yeah just a, a thought because. Okay. It's, um, yeah, great, good. And I have a sad piece. If I this is not the price to add it, but whenever you want to add a new piece, it's it's not new business. It's not old business, but it's new business. Okay, well, let me just see if anybody does have any yeah. new business. Then, anything issues. Um, 
things that we need to think about going forward, address. Okay. Well, again, if, you, if things come to you, let us know over the, the course of the next few months. Um, so Fred, I'll, I'll turn it back to you. Um, I'm very sad to report that uh, Moki Steiskel, who many of you knew, and was the only person who was the president of ICRI twice, so that was six years in office, spread over a period of time, she passed at the end of November. I don't know the details of it, but um, she she made a huge impact in Columbia State Community College, working with Carol Kaiser for years, and they were pillars of ICRI um, and culinary arts and hospitality. They really brought that pro that put that program on a national scale. She was on almost every task force or um, committee in ICRI always upbeat, always no nonsense. She's sort of the, even though she was in the Midwest, she's sort of the best of a Maine person, you know, yeah. sort of friendly, positive, and no nonsense, and let's get it done. And she in, invited everyone into things and then supported them. So uh, there'll yeah. be something in member Monday, but since we're all here, just wanted you to know. Fred, she was also very involved in ACFA in the early yeah, years. She was, and she got the award. She got the Joe... Uh, yeah. Purdue Award for her work. Yeah, absolutely. She was one of the first persons. Yeah. She did a real, get, she did a lot of really good things to help programs grow because of the way she wrote the reports as a yeah. member and, a, and the chair. Well, thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Always sad to hear, but nice to, to memorialize a little bit some of the, the great work that she did. Thank you. Anybody have any other comments or things they want to share? You're in five minutes early. Go, go. I know this. Yeah, keeping right on track. Well, that's that's okay wow. because oh, so, good. Some, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> I, I saw Michael has something in his hand. Oh, is that okay. a pad or something? Oh, the no, the pet, oh. the, the birdie. No, <laughs> it's Does the bird. Does the bird have anything for us? Anything to, to add? <laughs> Scout is remarkably quiet. Ah, I, uh, yeah, so, <laughs> that is so, true. She's a fidgeter, but you know she's remarkably quiet. Mm. So well, glad sorry. glad she's glad she's here with us. <laughs> yes, yes. And what I'm going to do now then is uh, we'll wrap up this the the official portion of the meeting. And we will turn to um, Caroline and, um, and Noel, and I know Forrest uh, from USM here, my colleague, um, work together to bring you this next part of the presentation. We've talked a lot about food. Uh, we, uh, um, last spring, my uh, local food and agritourism class worked with a class in Greenland to create a cookbook. You're going to hear more about that. It ended up winning awards. Um, and so we're very proud of, of the students, the, the amazing work. Caroline, as uh, a former TAH grad or a TAH graduate, one of our former students, now in a PhD program, came and really um, assisted the, the instructor in that class and then has worked really closely uh, with Noelle over these past weeks, even though she's had tons of, of final papers to do to bring you this presentation, to give you a little taste of Maine, a little bit of information, a little bit of an introduction to um, some of the people in our industry and, um, and just being able to learn about uh, wild blueberries, one of our, our major crops after lobster and seafood. And so I really appreciate their work. I've got my blueberries in my, my main blueberries we picked this summer and my drink in honor of this. Looking forward to, to hearing uh, what you have to say. So take it away. Well, Tracy, I, I really, I should have just stopped you because I think between everything shared today, I think we captured everything in our presentation already. So um, I we would love quick to just say you. <laughs> that we'll end it. But, you know, one of the things that Tracy mentioned earlier is this idea of working together. And as we start to think about our conference for the upcoming year, 
it's really about places within one location that will allow us to come together as a group in a community. And that's what we want to share uh, with you a little bit today. I'm just going to kick it off and then I'm going to pass it over um, to, to Caroline, who has really been instrumental in this. And if you don't recall, she has been actively engaged with many of our other events and activities. You may have even recalled um, at one point, um, the first time we met, she actually did a poster presentation at iCree. So again, definitely talent within our community. So first, we're just going to kick off with a little uh, promo video for you this morning. Now places that stink. Charm is a magical spell. The place's adventure needs only curiosity. The place is still free, still wild. So I, I hope that little promo has gotten you excited into the destination that we're we're all going to be going together um, to really share in this experience and really come, you know, to look and experience what this location has to offer. So I just wanted to offer a couple of brief highlights. I know that many of you have shared your experiences, and I know Jennifer had the opportunity, um, you know, to take a tour and see the site, but it truly is absolutely known for really the blending of that coastal area into this urban adventure. So whether it's the scenic coastline, the food scene, Fred had mentioned some of the arts and culture that's in this location, um, as well as the craft beer scene, lighthouses, you can name it. But as Tracy alluded to earlier, and where I want to acknowledge Caroline, I'm going to actually pass it over to her, is that she has been an instrumental part to a project um, at the university that has really worked to preserve some of the heritage and history in some of the key um, ingredients and you know some of the culinary specialties that come out of this particular area. So without further ado, I'm actually going to pass it over, um, you know, to Carolyn. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that was quite a build up, um, as I mentioned. I'm a 2022 graduate from Tracy's program, um, which I started after serving as an economic developer and service learning consultant for 25 years. So yes, I am an older student, in case you were wondering. Um, the ICRE conference in DC last year was actually my first ever academic conference and poster session um, as part of a conference sponsorship for April. I'm hoping to charter a lobster boat tour where you'll have the chance to harvest lobster with the real Lobsterman, which has been one of my research projects. So more details later if I can set that up. Um, so I'm going to talk briefly about the Taste of Two Worlds cookbook that was produced by USM's agritourism class, along with a group of amazing partners. And it's a great example of the conference theme around attract, retain, and engage. I took a version of this class in 2020 when I was an undergrad in the program, and that experience inspired me to pursue an interdisciplinary PhD at the University of Maine in agritourism, totally self-designed. Um, so the class had already changed my life once, and when I heard what was being planned for 2023, um, I was so excited, um, and I asked to take it as a graduate student. Uh, so the theme of the cookbook is two worlds, and it includes a collection of recipes from three cultures, Greenland, uh, the Wabanaki tribe in Maine, and then traditional New England culture. Um, and you can kind of move to the next slide. Uh, but the phrase two worlds has really a deeper meaning than the similarities and differences between Maine and Greenland. It really hints at a past in which the Western European 
world came into contact with the indigenous, not always with positive outcomes. Um, and within each country, there are youth who straddle these two worlds, one foot in the indigenous culture that values a balance of, of uh, with nature and the other foot in our modern society that's driven by consumerism. Um, as a first generation student uh, or American myself, um, I can personally relate to this dichotomy as I struggled between my parents' uh, culture from an authoritarian and patriarchal country versus a more open and in individualistic U.S. culture. Of course, one of the common denominators in every culture is food. Um, so that is what is celebrated here. The ways it is raised, grown, harvested, processed, and cooked. Uh, two weeks ago, our little cookbook went on to win three awards at the Gourmand International World Cookbook Fair, including Best Arctic Cookbook in the World, Best Cooking School Cookbook, and Best University Cookbook. Um, and now I'm going to talk just a little bit about the pedagogy behind all this. So back in the dead of winter, um, when this project began, it all seemed very messy and uncertain, as <laughs> many service learning projects do. As a student, I was really unsure how this was all going to result in a professional product, but I'm going to address some of what went on behind the scenes. Uh, first, um, the backbone of this project was a partnership between USM, the Wabanaki tribe, uh, the Anuli Cooking School in Greenland, uh, the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and the Greenlandic Institute of Natural Resources. Um, funded by a grant from the U.S. Department of State, um, these partners had already participated in a series of cultural exchange exchanges over a period of three years. And this cookbook was part uh, one part of this larger alliance and this project. Um, so that process provided the foundation of mutual trust that gave rise to the cookbook project. But still, students like me had not engaged in those cultural exchanges. So we were all sort of learning along with each other and the instructors. And as a grad student, I got to help teach parts of the class, which was very exciting. So I'm just gonna touch on some of the outcomes or, um, in terms of the academic part, um, students learned about local food, the local food system, sustainability, fair trade, understanding indigenous versus Western perspectives, and then the difference between culinary tourism, ecotourism, and agritourism. On the skill side, um, they really learned to develop their creative voice. Um, I know when I took this class um, three years ago, um, after 25 years of work experience and a previous college degree, I had never, ever written in a creative voice, you know, since high school. So that was really new for me. And it's such a valued outcome of my experience with the program that I continue to use in my professional life. Um, but besides the creative voice interviewing skills, um, social media skills. I, I personally had never used Instagram until taking the class. Um, of course, research skills. And then, you know, the unwritten agenda of active listening and working from working with people from diverse cultures. Even within the class, we had students from South Africa and Sudan. And then there was obviously the community impact, which was in service of the cookbook production. And some of the activities included a field trip to Bangor, Maine to learn about the indigenous per perspective and cook the Wabanaki recipes in the cookbook with tribal leaders. Um, we also um, cooked the New England recipes together at Southern Maine Community College with local chefs and food producers, presenting uh, Maine recipes with a modern twist. Um, we participated in a live class with students in Greenland, and then we were each assigned one of the recipes and produced a uh, 500 to 1,000 word essay on a specific pr food product, uh, the main ones being lobster, blueberries, mussels, seaweed, and monkfish, um, including research, interviews with industry leaders, and again, developing that creative voice. 
We also had students doing capstones who were not in the class, but doing the social media around the project, the illustrations and the recipe development itself. And the capstone students, many of whom you see in the photos, were able to travel to Greenland where they spent two weeks learning about indigenous culture and history, and then actually cooking the Maine and Greenlandic recipes, which were featured in an open house about the project. Uh, the semester is short, as you know, so the cookbook production itself, like the design, layout, and editing, happened outside the structure of the class with representatives from each of the partners, plus our publisher, Edible Maine, and then every student, capstone students and students in the class, got to help present the project at the Arctic Circle Assembly in Reykjavik in October, which, oh my goodness, it was a once in a lifetime, just an incredible experience. So now we're just going to share a couple of snippets from the cookbook focused on wild blueberries, which was the section I got to write. Um, in Maine, uh, I like to say wild blueberries are part of the holy trinity, uh, lobster, potatoes, and wild blueberries. Uh, but I am embarrassed to say that I lived in Maine for 27 years before I found out the difference between wild blueberries and ordinary ones. So now you're going to get the benefit of that that new knowledge in our brief video. Caroline Paris, and this is Kate McCarty. And we're gonna talk about Maine wild blueberries this afternoon. Maine is actually the nation's leading producer of wild blueberries. They've actually been growing in Maine for 10,000 years, ever since the glaciers retreated from North America, depositing a barren tundra. Um, and we call them the blueberry barrens. And we've got a root system that extends for miles and miles underground. And in one field, you can find 1,500 genetically distinct varieties of wild blueberries. Um, of course, our indigenous tribes were the first to harvest them, and I understand they not only ate them raw like we do, but they also uh, dried them in the sun and formed them into cakes so that they can enjoy them in, in the winter. Another thing that I learned is that the tribes instituted this practice that continues to this day, where they actually burn the fields, and that really promotes the robust regrowth of the roots because it takes two years to make one wild blueberry. And I hear they taste really good. Yeah, my favorite factoid about Maine wild blueberries is, is that they are one of the world's top 10 superfoods. They actually have more antioxidants than 20 other fruits and vegetables. Um, you read about antioxidants in the news all the time. They're the organic compounds that neutralize the free radicals that, that promote the inflammation and that's associated with uh, cancer, Alzheimer's disease, and uh, type 2 diabetes. So they're really good for you. And over the last 25 years, they've actually discovered other benefits of wild blueberries, including um, the slowing of cognitive decline and improved eye vision and health, which is pretty amazing. So I didn't know, Caroline, if you want me to just stop here one second, I do at least want to interject that what was amazing about this is when Tracy and her students were presenting at the Arctic Circle Conference in Reykjavik, I was also there. So what Tracy doesn't share with you, and, you know, it was because I serve in the capacity as the vice president, Nina, is I was forced or voluntold to help drag all of these cookbooks in a broken suitcase with no wheels and Tracy what at least a mile it felt like multiple miles but we couldn't even physically lift this bag of cookbooks that is how absolutely heavy um, but to just have an opportunity to personally meet the indigenous partners and I'm not sure if you're able to see it here I'm gonna try to share it on my screen because I do have like a screensaver on there 
Um, but it's even from the, the Wanaki tribe partners. And, you know, there was just so much culture and exposure to those things that they really value that are natively found, you know, in this area um, and how they're preserving it. And as Carolyn said at the very beginning, you know, this balance to achieve between, you know, really nature and embracing it. Um, so I at least wanted to just interject that that in there before we continue. You are one of the experts featured in our cookbook. Um, tell us about yourself. Yes, thank you so much for asking me to be a part of your project. Um, so I'm Kate McCarty. I have two roles that led me to be tapped as an expert for this book. I'm a local food writer, so I have a food blog called The Blueberry Files. I've been writing on it for 15 years now, the entire time I've lived in Maine. And I'm also um, the food preservation expert at the University of Maine Cooperative Extension, where I teach workshops around canning, freezing, drying, fermenting, um, and manage a group of volunteers to do the same thing. So our viewers might not know this, but Maine was actually the first state in the nation to institute prohibition way back in 1851. And you actually wrote the book on the subject. So I'm hoping... Well, I think we lost the sound. I I was just going to check and I was just writing. Did anyone else lose the sound or is it just me? Maybe we could pause it and start it and see. We all just, lost it. Everybody, okay. You guys lost the sound? Yep. Yep. Yeah. When you sh when you share your screen, there should be a button on the bottom left that says optimize for video. Um, you might have to stop sharing and then reshare. Okay, I can do that. Um, Let me, uh, I'll stop when, sharing. Hold on here. And now when you reshare, there should be a button uh, in the bottom left that says like optimize for video or something yeah. like that. That'll pipe the video through Zoom rather than, you know. Yeah, we'll see her. Sorry about well, that. Well, and while while she's getting reset up, I'll just jump in. And yes, I, I did recruit her to drag 150 very heavy cookbooks in my suitcase across Iceland during the rain and wind one night because you know, we're thrifty Yankees and I did not want to have to pay the hundreds and hundreds of dollars to ship our cookbooks over to Greenland. So I put them in my suitcase and we passed them on to my colleague. But yeah, little did I realize the the wheels wouldn't quite work under that that weight. So anyway, back to the video. Um, people use that to hydrate after working in the field. I just want to stop. Can everyone hear it now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, just back it up a little bit. A little more yeah because it's got the history of the shrub right. like when i hold up the book that's pretty much when that sound stopped <laughs> okay hold on. Oh, right there yeah one and you actually wrote the book on the subject <laughs> so i'm hoping that you can tell us um what is the role of a shrub in maine's cocktail history sure so shrubs are kind of like the first cocktail that existed. Um, so like you said, Maine had prohibition of alcohol starting in 1850. And prior to that, um, the beverage that a lot of people relied on in the colonial time was called a shrub. It was a way to preserve local fruit. And they kind of used it as like a, a Gatorade, um, as a beverage to enjoy after a hot day working in the fields. It was hydrating and had a lot of flavor between the fruit that you would use, they would add vinegar and a little bit of sweetener, sometimes sugar, or if they use local maple syrup. And so you mash all those together and you get something they call a drinking vinegar, adds a little bit of interest to your otherwise perhaps bland diet, <laughs> and used a lot of local ingredients. Um, and so um, people use that to hydrate after working in the fields, but then also you could use a little bit, um, add a little bit of alcohol to make one of the first cocktails that we had here in the state. 
So Kate, you were one of Maine's original food bloggers. I'm so impressed that you've been doing this for 15 years. What are some of your favorite signature foods from Maine that our visitors coming to the conference absolutely need to try? Mm -hmm. Well, of course, everyone's going to want to think, or everyone will think lobster when they come to Maine, and that's true. We have a lot of great lobster and other seafood dishes, so if they like lobster, seafood, they should definitely go into the Old Port Commercial Street, try some of our seafood dishes down there. One of my favorite lobster rolls is Bite Into Maine. I love that one. Um, but there's so many other great foods in, in Portland to try. You know, we're kind of known for that farm-to-table, Ameri new American cooking, so there's so many good restaurants and even a bunch lately have opened with some international flair so really it's just the incredible food and drink scene in Portland that that your conference goers should be excited for. And we're back with Asher Boisvert, the beverage manager at Cheval in Ugly Duckling. Thank you for creating an original cocktail for our cookbook. Um, it's called the Beast Mode Blueberry Cocktail and we're hoping that you can walk us through it. Thank you, Caroline. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so happy to be part of this book and everything, and um, let's get to shaking, I guess, yeah. All right, so um, so the, the way this cocktail works, um, I guess the thing that influenced me the most was the initial, this part of it, I guess, the um, blueberry vermouth, which is a local product made by Ross. It's a really fun little company. They make um, a blueberry wine, and they also make this, um, which is a, it's a blueberry vermouth. Um, so this, the initial idea of this cocktail was um, something in the Boulevardier, something in that Negroni realm where it's bitter, it's got like that sweet, but it's just, it's a heavy cocktail, I, I guess. Um, I often use the word like ruminative or something. Uh, so it's one you can just sit and sip. Um, so yeah, let's get started. So this is the blueberry. The next part of this is um, the cinnamon mezcal that I use for this. Um, it's really easy. I just grab a bottle of Vita or whatever mezcal you have that you generally like. I wouldn't go with the most expensive one. And I just put about four cinnamon sticks in it and let it sit for about a couple weeks. And then you have cinnamon mezcal. And I was influenced by that. I had a friend who had gone to Oaxaca and she brought me back a couple bottles of uh, mezcal. And I was just blown away by how different they were than anything that, like, really we had in the States or I had come across. Um, so I, I, I don't know how it happened, but I, I had some Mexican cinnamon, which is referred to as Ceylon cinnamon. Um, and it has similar components to cinnamon, but it's more earthy, less spicy, less, like, just almost tastes like earth, you know. Um, so that's what that, that's how that happened. So we'll use some cinnamon mezcal. And then the next local product we're going to be using is the oat whiskey, which is made uh, just downtown in Portland. And that is by Liquid Riot. And um, I happen to think it's one of the better whiskeys that I've had in a while. So it's very unique. It's, it's still young, but it's really cool product. And there's more. And there's more. <laughs> there's more indeed. Yeah. So this is... Um, in the, uh, I don't know how this happened. Uh, okay, this is in the book as being maple syrup and salt. Um, I do, it, when I use it for myself though, I age grapefruit rinds for about six months with salt and sugar. And um, it sort, it's essentially creating like a, a preserve of sorts, you know? Um, I then cook that, I cook those down and I add some maple syrup. So it has like this umami, this salty, this super tart. Um, and that, I use that as my base for a lot of my old fashioned cocktails, anything that requires demerara or something like that. So something that's gonna have just like that maple vibe. And the maple and blueberry, I mean, it's kind of an oat, kind of tastes like breakfast to a certain extent. Um, and that's kind of why I like that cocktail so much. Uh, so we got that and then just a little orange bitters. The science behind this is amazing. We have fun, yeah. We've come what, a long way. What do you recommend your guests um, pair with this beast mode blueberry cocktail? Um, I mean, I always I mean, treat it like other blueberry thing. I mean, I guess a goat cheese salad, something with like 
I know in the past when we've had it, we generally do this cocktail in springtime. Um, and you have lots of nice things popping up then, like fiddleheads, any sort of greens, any salads. I like that. Because um, this isn't a sweet drink. The blueberry has a really unique nature to it. Um, than, you know, different from other fruits in the sense that like it can provide this tannic nature, which we've talked about. But I think that that I mean I've always loved using it like pairing it with Campari, something like that. It, it's strong enough to not get lost, but it also isn't gonna like become overly sweet. So the tannic nature of it just really comes through nicely. Um, so any salad, anything with cheese, anything like that. I mean even just like a charcuterie board would be fun. Uh, with this cocktail, and it could be done at the end of the meal too, for that matter, it could be a nice dessert. Um, so yeah. Yeah, we always think of uh, Maine Wild Blueberries as being sweeter right. than regular blueberries. So how does this particular drink not you know, become sweet? Is it during the fermentation process? There is a sweet nature to it, but it's, it's a definitely, I would, it's, it's what's referred to as an Americano vermouth, mm -hmm. and that means they're using a lot of gentian root in that. So gentian root has this, by nature, has a super bitter quality to it. It's, it's almost like that thing that dries out your tongue when you're drinking tea. So pair that with the tannic nature of the blueberries, and it's just like this beautiful match made in heaven. Um, like think of like an over, over, over steep tea with blueberries, and it's, it's perfect. Um, so I think it, it, it definitely resists from being sweet in that sense. Um, yeah. Well, great. I hope um, our guests will be coming to uh, Portland, Maine in the spring. Please, so yeah. hopefully they can have this drink in person at Cheval. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you so much. Cheers. So I again want to reiterate and I'll allow Tracy and Carolyn to also do some final words, but, you know, just thank you so much for the engagement, the interaction, bringing us this demo. Um, as you may have seen online, Frank has posted the mocktail version of this drink for you all to try over the holiday season. Please note it takes about two days before it's ready to drink. Um, and I just want to thank you with our final reminders, at least from my end, which is to remember we're here to come together uh, to attract, engage, and retain for our 2024 spring conference. Great. And I, I'll jump in, Caroline. Just did you have any final words or? Uh, yeah, I guess um, I, I will say I'm from, originally from Southern California, and I've been in Maine now for 30 years, and it has just become part of my soul. And we're just so happy to welcome you to this very special and magical place. And thank you again for all the great work and, and projects and help that, that you've been doing. And I think this is just such a great example of that level of engagement that we have with our students. Um, that can be some of the, the best practices that we all can learn from. And I know you all probably have some great examples too. And so we're excited to hear about those and, and have us all learn from each other together. And my, my final word is just, I, I want to make sure to give a, just a respectful um, acknowledgement of the partnership that I've had with uh, our Wabanaki partners here in Maine. I've been working with them for three years. Um, they have volunteered countless hours with our students learning about in our event management class, in our sustainable community tourism development class, in our agritourism class on um, the importance of um, uh, learning about different cultures, uh, engaging with others, um, the learning about the the very negative past um, that we have with with um, our indigenous people, and but showing incredible patience and hope and kindness on how we move forward, and it's through connections and education and sharing food and talking to each other. And they were able to accompany me through this Arctic Education Alliance grant that Noel had mentioned to Greenland uh, for, and to work with our Greenlandic partners in giving voice to that as part of tourism um, and food systems and, and all of that. And so we 
uh, hope and, and we know that it has changed lives for our students to understand that you're not just doing this work um, and learning these skills um, in a vacuum, that there's history there and how do you engage with other people and cultures. So I just want to make sure that that um, piece of it is, is really recognized. I have appreciated that. And we've worked really hard to cultivate a, a trust and a respect together. Um, and they will be a part of our conference. So when you come, uh, we will host a reception with some of these more of our foods from the cookbook and, and they'll be together um, helping to, to welcome us. Any of the projects that we did in Greenland or with them has always come from them too. That's another point. I just want to end with that in, in any of our work with diversity, it's always about what the, the group we're working with wants and needs and feels is valued um, as, as a way to kind of move forward. So this cookbook came out of that and, and who knew there was like an Oscars of the cookbooks with these Gourmand Awards? I didn't until until the the guy that runs it this summer said, "I'm seeing this online and please submit it." And um, and it's just a tribute to the incredible work that that partnership brought and that these students did. And so, really excited to share that with you. Thank you all. I will end this five minutes early. So you'll have five more minutes of your day to catch up, take a breath, whatever that is. Thank you again to our incredible board and to all of, uh, all of you wonderful members. It was great seeing you and hope to see you in person in Maine in a couple of months. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Happy holidays. <laughs>